great to be in church this morning, as it is every Sunday morning. Uh, in the church calendar, what people call the church calendar, this is the Sunday before Easter. So we, all, we recognize that as often as Palm Sunday in history. We remember the time when Jesus entered Jerusalem to the shouts of praise, especially from children. If you read this story, this story, the event, the children were praising him, saying, Hosanna, which means save us. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So some people did recognize him as Lord, but by the end, by, by just a few days later, um, I think many others were calling for his crucifixion. And we think of that this morning and through this week, and we look forward to a wonderful Resurrection Sunday next Sunday. Why don't we stand together as we sing, I have a longing in my heart for Jesus. I'm weary. Number 156, if you need the words in the chorus book. I have a longing in my heart. We'll join together once more as we make our way back to our seats. I have a longing in my heart. Amen. Now we'll take our hymnal. And uh, switch over to the hardback uh, book with the songs in it and turn to number 465. 465. And once you've found that, uh, maybe, I should, maybe I should have taken care of this while we were walking around. Find your phone and make sure it's off or on silent. I don't know, Ms. Pastor Olson, somebody, somebody had a persistent, uh, persistent uh, somebody was trying to get a hold of them in Sunday school and it rang and it rang and it in, in the auditorium, when it might be you, it's like, is that coming from over there, or is it coming from over there? It seemed to I thought maybe it was an, an emergency alert. There was stuff going on all over the place. We don't want that. I, I was glad mine didn't go off, and I turned, turned the whole phone off. I don't know. I, don't, I think that means it won't go off, but I know that some people think it's still tracing me. Anyway, take care of your phone while we sing, I've thirsted in the barren land of sin, sin and shame, nothing satisfying there I found. Springs of living water, number 465. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame.
Amen. Let's remain standing for prayer. This morning, Elio Gashat will lead us. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for who you are, Lord. And we come this morning with um, our heart full of joy, Lord, for the um, ultimate sacrifice you did for us on the cross, Lord. And also um, the burial and resurrection, Lord. And thank you for all that, Lord, which bring us love and salvation and hope. Please, as we hear this morning to um, hear your word, Lord, I pray for uh, Mr. Rimmer's given strength, wisdom, and boldness. He will be preaching your word, Lord. Give us a heart to capture your word and a hear to listen to your word. Give us a wonderful day today. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And now, once more, we're going to switch back to the chorus book. There's a song in there we want to sing next. Number 165, 165, I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. The way of the cross leads home, 165. I must needs go home.
Okay, it's good to see everyone out this morning, and we'd like to extend a special welcome uh, to our visitors. So our ushers have just come down. They've got a visitor card, a pen, a bookmark. And what we'd like you to do, if you're visiting with us for the first time, is just slip up your hand as they uh, usher back there toward the back. If, if you're here for the first time, just lift, lift up your hand. We'd like to get a record of your attendance here. They'll give you one of those. Okay, wonderful. And then you can uh, fill that out. In just a couple minutes, we're going to have the offering plates come by. The ushers will be coming back down here in just a minute here. And so if you, in the, in the next couple minutes, get that filled out, we'd love to have uh, a record of your attendance and be able to help you in any way we can to, uh, in your relationship with the Lord. And as the ushers uh, come back down now, uh, just a couple other announcements. Uh, <clears throat> this evening we have our 5.30 p.m. service. Hope that you can be back for us there. Another opportunity to hear God's word preached. And some churches... They might have a Sunday morning service only. Other churches, uh, maybe they have like two services and it's the same sermon on, on both times during the weekend. Not so here. You get to come here. And the first hour we have our Sunday adult Sunday school class and we have something different for you there. And then you come into the main service here and there'll be another message for you. And then we come back at 530 and there'll be yet another message. So... Come, come this evening at 5.30, then Wednesday we have a special uh, time for the retired folks, and that's called uh, Jolly Sixties at 11 a.m. We have a time of fe fellowship, food, and, and preaching there for them as well. And also on Thursday at 6.45 we have our workers meeting, and at 7 p.m. midweek service, but please note that there will be no King's Kids and Flyers this week especially here with the college being on spring break. Friday is uh, RU, the recovery program on, at 7 p.m. on Friday night. Upcoming um, announcements here as Brock comes to pray for us here in just a moment uh, is Easter Sunday next weekend. Now, uh, what a wonderful time to be able to celebrate the Lord's resurrection. There'll be a special program for the with the children. And because of that, we're going to combine our services, and we'll have one morning service at 10.30 a.m. and not the Sunday school hour. So we're going to combine it all. We'll start a little earlier, so be here at 10.30. And, but also keep in mind, next week, our evening service is at the normal time. All right, Brock. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness. And God, I just thank you for our church, Lord. I pray that you would just... Uh, Calm our hearts, Lord. God, and just let them be willing to accept a message that's preached at us. And, and God, I just pray that uh, you'd give the speaker wisdom, Lord. Bless the offering. Give us a good rest of the day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Let's take our hymnals again and stand if you can, turning to number 241, 241. Have you any room for Jesus? He who bore your load of sin. 241 in our hymnal. Amen. You may be seated.
Well, good morning. I, I'm excited about being up here. I was just down with the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders in our junior church class, and they are getting ready for next Sunday's Easter program. Hard to believe. Uh, it's only been three months since the Christmas program and the Easter program, so I feel like we're just practicing again and again and again, but they're doing a good job, so make sure you bring out some guests. Sorry, I left the teenagers out. Teenagers are helping with me in the program as well, but uh, so pray that that goes well. I don't know how I got put in charge. I can't sing. I sing on a hill far away. That's the best place to sing for me. But uh, either way, good to see you all this morning. Let me see your Bibles. Can I see your Bibles this morning? Or your phones? For you millennials. <laughs> I like my old Bible right in front of me. But uh, um, we're going to use them today. We're going to get through a lot of stuff. And so I hope you're awake uh, today. If not, I might just have to call your name, right, Brother Barnett? And we'll see how long you can last. <laughs> But uh, I'm glad to be here. Are you glad you're in church today? Amen. amen. All right. That's probably the only amen we'll get the rest of the day, but that's okay. It makes me feel good. Uh, Genesis chapter 19. Genesis 19. We're going to look at a boatload of scriptures. Uh, and I, 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 I labored over this message. I don't know if it's a Sunday morning message or not. It's heavy. It's been heavy on my heart. I have one more chapter to finish in the book of uh, Genesis. So I've been going through Genesis this month. And th this selection about the man we're going to discuss today kind of grabbed a hold of my heart. This is not a message to teenagers. It's not a message to singles. It's a message to us men. And, uh, and so if you're not a man, at least you know, say amen. It makes it easier because you're like, get them, sick them, preacher. Um, but I think we can apply it in all sorts of areas in our lives. And so we'll, we'll look at... Uh, this message today. My, my goal is to issue a warning, kind of to raise your awareness about some things in the scripture. So I'm going to ask that you pray with me and pray for me this morning as we look at God's word. Let's pray. God, I need my heart quieted this morning. I've kind of been running around a uh, bus and program practice and junior church and these things, and it's a wonderful thing. But God, we come now, uh, these People have assembled this morning not to hear from me, but to hear from you. And, and if we can leave today knowing that we heard from you, it would be well worth our time. If it's an opinion of mine or something that's uh, fun to say, it really doesn't, it's not going to help us in life. But these verses that we'll look at today have really grabbed my attention. And, and I trust it can grab the attention of especially the men those that would be leading homes in the future, and that would be something that we can leave helped because we were in your house today. Thank you for the Lord's Day. I pray that you'd bless as we speak your word. In Christ's name, amen. There was a man by the name of Glenn Cunningham. Years ago, he was hiking <clears throat> near uh, by Victoria Falls over in Zambia. If you've been there, I've been there. If you've seen uh, any pictures or footage of it, a lot of times it produces a quite a large cloud of mist, to uh, very heavy, so it's hard to, hard to see if you're there trying to get a view of the scenic landscapes and so forth. And he said, while I was walking the path that, out, that skirts the gorge into which the Zambezi River tumbles, I noticed a sign on the rim, but could not make it out. Not wanting to miss whatever the sign said, I kind of slid my way through the fence and got a little bit closer towards the very brink, only to read the message, danger, crumbling edge. <laughs> uh, he quickly scurried back to the path that he was on. And uh, we kind of think that's a funny story, but truth is, somebody had put a sign out there to say, warning, there's danger ahead. When I, when I was praying about the message, praying about how the Lord was dealing with my heart, really the title is this, when life is about to cave in, or is your life about to cave in? And when I came across that title and was thinking about it, um, my mind went back to, you might know this story, but about 10, 10 11 years ago, there was an incident over in Mount Baldy uh, there in Michigan City, and some of you might be aware of it. And so I kind of was looking it up, trying to find some details, and it was interesting. Just about a year ago, a, a new article was put out, kind of... Uh, going back to the parents and, and the young man that was involved. And so I'm just going to go through it because I think it sets the tone 
for what we're going to talk about. So most of us know the dunes. Um, in, in, in the last uh, 13, 14 years, there have been 20 drownings over in Lake Michigan in the Dunes State Park in that area. 2013, however, there was a potential drowning, we'll call it, took place, but it was hundred, hundreds of yards away from the lake. In fact, this six-year-old boy, this potential drowning, didn't involve a drop of water. It was a July day on a family outing to the popular beach at Mount Baldy. Baldy. I think if you've climbed it enough, I've, I think I've tallied up how many steps it is, but it's a 126-foot dune, and it's about an hour from Chicago, and there was a family called the Wassner family, Greg and Faith were the parents, and they came from Sterling, Illinois. And this is where they, they kind of relived the story, if you will, and they said that's where we found Nathan's parents to take us back to that traumatic summer day, July of 2013. Greg says this to dad. It pretty much started out as a long weekend camping with friends. There was a trail going up to the top of the dunes. Nathan, who was six years old at the time, he and his friends were following their dads. Suddenly, a panicked call to the dads from the friend who said Nathan disappeared in a hole. Through his initial confusion, there it was, plain as day, a round black hole about 15 to 18 inches in diameter, perfectly round hole, straight down what dad uh, Nathan's father Greg said Greg could hear Nathan but he couldn't see him he said I was actually talking with Nathan he was still down there you could tell he was worked up scared just pretty much trying to calm him down he said we'll get to you don't worry but then a few seconds later after as Greg and his friend began digging the hole caved in it collapsed Nathan's friend ran down to get help Another dad ran over to the dune to the parking lot to a phone to call 911. By then, the other boy made it to Nathan's mom. Just by the tone of his voice and his expression, he was just so frightened. And it frightened me, mom said. Her name is Faith. She says, my mind couldn't grasp or understand. And I just remember, no, 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 no. Together, on their knees, furiously clawing at the sand, the situation was dire. Greg said, I was digging, digging, digging. We were digging with all our might in the sand. Obviously, was so unforgiving. Faith said, I remember praying, immediately praying, asking God to give him air to breathe, to hold him. And I kept repeating over and hold him, give him air to breathe. Emergency responders arrived. Strangers joined in with shovels at first, then excavating equipment. If you ever dig in sand, you'd never get anywhere unless you try to get big. You have to just go very, very wide. A backhoe was brought in, but still no sign of Nathan. I remember telling God, Faith said, Mom said, I need him back. I need you to give him back to me. I know he's special, but I need him back. And it was that same for over and over and over again. Agonizingly, the effort stretched on. Greg, at this point, it's been so long, he said they were on a recovery mission now, not a rescue. Josh Zimmer was a man they called in to help with the excavation, and he said he was prepared for the worst. He was called upon to bring in his bigger backhoe to pick up where the smaller one left off. Together, they did the careful work of digging. He said his friend Ryan had a small probe, and it would go down about two inches just because they didn't know where he was, and they're trying to probe down and just to be super careful. And um, then news came three hours later, nearly 12 feet underground, they reached Nathan after unearthing, get this, 400 tons of sand. But as many feared, the outcome was grim. His body was limp and cold. He had no pulse. I don't know if you want to call it a mood, but it was quiet and sad and still because nobody knew. He had no vital signs, Mr. Zimmer recalled. And in that moment of darkness, as Greg and Faith were on their way to the hospital to identify the body, is where the miracle on Mount Baldy was revealed. A paramedic noticed a wound on Nathan's face was bleeding, telling him his heart must still be pumping. They went into a frenzy. Suddenly he was back, and they were doing everything they could to stabilize him, Mom said. They rushed us to the hospital. Greg struggles to find the words and motions towards his wife. That's the point right there in the waiting room. But he came in right to her. He's alive. Best words I ever heard, she said. Today, Nathan is a sophomore at Unity Christian School in Fulton, Illinois. It's over near Clinton, Illinois, if you know that area. He bears no sign of his trauma. He's a standout athlete on basketball team, plays soccer, is a member of the school volleyball team. But he says this, what I do have is gratitude. He said, God was there, and God is the reason I'm still here today. Somebody else was changed by that day, a man by the name of Josh Zimmer, the one who brought in the bigger uh, backhoe. He said, I got back. I couldn't go to sleep that night. I knew God was real. 
because he did something I knew was, no, was impossible. That night, he called his family's pastor and was baptized in the church. <laughs> my in-laws came. They got out of bed, and my wife, the preacher's wife, yeah, it was a life-changing moment. <laughs> How did Nathan survive? There's all sorts of stories. Um, he just says, I think the Lord was with me. Um, I, I read that, and the dad closes by saying this. Slow down and capture and love every moment that you can with your kids, your loved ones. Now, a whole lot happened because something caved in. That's quite a dramatic story, uh, not so dramatic. Uh, about six or eight weeks ago, I was gone in Michigan. It was that week where we had the cold weather going on. And I get a text from, I think it was Gideon or my wife, and I pull this video up, and I just hear water. And I look in my bedroom, and the ceiling, a water pipe had burst, and the ceiling caved in. It's not quite as dramatic. We weren't drowning. I wasn't in a canoe, you know, going around the house or anything like that. But, but there was water just kind of coming out of our room, going out into the kitchen, dining room. And uh, I wasn't there. And I just remember my wife said about 25, 30 people showed up, and they're scooping water out and we're moving clothes and all this type of thing and uh, we're still recovering from that I guess if you will but truth is when there's a cave in lots of things change if we knew that the water pipe right above our bed would have been working its way to be open we probably would have made some preparations for it not to happen are you with me behind the scenes uh, there's, if you will, in our lives, and this is where I'm going, there may be some things that not seen to us, but making preparations for our homes, our lives, our world to cave in. And I'd like to issue a warning, if I could. Genesis chapter number 19 Verse number 30. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zoar and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And I, I wrestled with reading the following verses because frankly, it's pretty sick. But we're going to. Look at verses 31. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose, and it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Yuck! Now, we live in a sick world today. There's lots of filthiness and disgustingness going on. But I stop and think, this is a long time ago. And may I say, our flesh and ourselves are capable of just about anything wicked if let go. And I would like to say, this is when it begins for Lot, when his life and his home and his family begins to cave in. But I think there are some signs there are some things that you and I can be aware of in our homes, in our relationships, in our Christian lives that I'd like to issue a warning. And I, and I brought my flag. It's not a red flag. It's Titus's referee flag. And I just want to today just kind of wave the flag. If you're driving down the road and you see construction, what do they do? There's a lot of times there's flagmen ahead and they're saying, slow down, caution. If you're a NASCAR fan or a racing fan, sometimes when there's an accident up ahead, what do they do? They wave the flag. And what does it cause you to do? It's caused you to say, slow down, caution, stop. And that's my goal today as we look at the life of Lot. I'm saying there's a potential for a cave-in if I am not careful. And a cave-in can get messy. It can get real ugly. Can you imagine 
talking to Lot about six months after this situation. Can you imagine just sitting there? Lot, how did, how did this happen? How did you become the father from your, from your two daughters? How sick is that? But can I say it? It didn't start out that way. Peter writes, I'll read these verses, but Peter writes in his second epistle, chapter 2, he says this. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. I don't know if you know, all know the story about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, but God looked down. They were extremely wicked, and God says, I'm going to destroy them. And the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter number 19, we'll look at it briefly in just a little bit, that God sent fire and brimstone and wiped out those cities. God hates sin. And Lot was living in this city. And so he he sees these cities destroyed. He goes up into this cave, if you will, and he has this situation happen. But I would say, as I read Peter's epistle, continuing on, it says this, and delivered just Lot. And initially when I read that when I was younger, I thought he delivered only Lot. But that's not what it means. The word just, if I say, it was just me there, you'd think he was the only one. And he delivered just Lot. It's not just he's the only one. It calls him just. Notice what else it says. He says, for that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day. So as I looked at looked at this, as I studied this, it seems to indicate that Lot was able in some way to keep his character somewhat above board. As he lived in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, he was able to keep somewhat of his character. The Bible says he was vexed. He was bothered. It burdened him to see the, the wickedness that was in the cities. But he accepted it. It came to be, it's okay. And he just grew to live With this. You're in Genesis chapter 19. Would you flip over to Genesis chapter 12 and we will get going? I've got just some couple points here. But but it didn't start out as bad as it is, if I can say it that way. All right. Um, The first time we see Lot mentioned is Genesis chapter number 12. And God comes to Abraham in verse number one and says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house. Uh, Verse number 5, and Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son. So we see Abram. Now help me out this morning. If if, uh, when you hear the name Abram or Abraham, could I just see from you to help help wake you up, thumbs up or thumbs down? Go ahead. You can just, all right, thumbs up. We typically will talk about man by the name of Abraham. Uh, He's a man of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us by faith, Abraham. He's a man, the Bible tells us, that feared God. He was a man that was called, I love this, he was called the the friend of God. Wouldn't that be awesome if that was your testimony? He was a man who was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac for God. He was a man who left his homeland not knowing whither he went, the Bible says. He was a man who pleaded for the lives of those he cared for. Now watch me close. Uh, Lot was able to be surrounded and to be with a man of God. Can I say it? It is important to stick with the men of God that are around you. Amen. We have choices to make. And Lot, in chapter 12, we see him. He was with Abram. Look at chapter number 13. Verse number 1, and Abram went out of Egypt, his wife, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. Verse 5, and Lot also which went with Abram. So we see him. They were in communication. There was fellowship. And so we see it didn't start out so bad. He was around somebody that was a man of faith, a man that was a friend of God. Let me say this. You, who you spend time with will determine who you are. Bitter people like to be around bitter people. Critical people like to be around critical people. Lazy people like to be around lazy people. You know my favorite crowd to be around is people who serve God. I love being around serving people. I like to be around friendly people. I would say this, if it feels good, notify your face. But there's something just fun to be around somebody that has the same things in common. 
And so here's Lot. He's able to be with Abraham. He probably saw Abraham's faith. Yes, there were some speed bumps in Abraham's life. Yes, there were some failures, but he looked and he saw a man that walked with God, a man that knew how to pray, a man that was the friend of God, a man that experienced faith. He got to see it. He was around it. It was a good thing for, for Lot. So the first flag I'd like to raise this morning is I call it the flag of separation. Now, all of a sudden, young people are like, whoa, 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 whoa. I knew you were going there. No, it's not what you think. I'm not talking about come out from among them and be separate. No, it's a different type of separation. There are times in life when separation is going to happen, right? I, I think um, May 25, 1999, I married Rosanna Johnson. That day, I left my father and mother, and I have cleaved to my wife for almost 25 years. That was a good day. That was a separation date. Separation is going to happen when it comes to marriage. There are people sometimes that have to go off to war. There's a time to separate and go fight for your country. There's people that are here, and they've had to go away off to college. All right, They leave home. God says, I want you to train. So, so there's separation going on. There's times... Uh, I think Mr. O'Hare was just telling me, uh, one of the first people they were able to see saved over at Addison Point recently, just this week went to heaven. There's a time of separation. There's a time when people leave this earth, and hopefully they end up going on to heaven. But I want to talk about this idea of separation. Separation is imminent. It will happen. Separation is not a bad thing, and we see it happens in the life of Abraham. Look at chapter number 13. And the land was not able to bear them. Speaking of Lot and Abram, they had too much stuff. Their substance was great, the Bible says, so that they could not dwell together, verse 7, and there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled in the land. Verse number 9, Abram says, Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself. So this is not Lot coming to say, I want to get away from you. It's not what he says. Abram says this is a good thing. Separation is imminent. We have to move. So Abram comes and says it in verse number 9. Go down to verse number 11. Then Lot chose him all the plains of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. Here it is. And they separated themselves. Verse number 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that, Lot was separated. So separation is not a bad thing. Separation is actually a good thing. Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says God separated day and night. God separated light and darkness. God separated male and female. Separation is a good thing. Land animals versus sea and air animals. We see separation all the time, don't we? Go to the grocery store. Aren't you glad that the spices are not in the produce section? There's signs that say this is where everything is, and you don't, you know, if you if you have a certain kind you like, aren't you glad it's not? Well, it could be in aisle six or aisle one or aisle twenty-three. They kind of keep it all nice and separated for us. Everybody's looking at me like they're tired today. All right, separation is a good thing. And so when you go to, you know, I'm, I'm glad that McDonald's is at, not at the bank. I, I can go to McDonald's. There's a bank. I don't have to worry about uh, the different confusions that could go on. Uh, places of business. There's a place of business. That you go there, you have to deal with six other things going on. Separation. Sports teams. We're in March Madness. You don't normally say, huh, I wonder what team they're playing for. I wonder what team they're rooting for. It's pretty obvious they have chosen to separate themselves. Separation is a good thing. Work uniforms. My dad worked at U.S. Steel for 40 years. 40 years. Uh, he wore mint green pants. That would not have been my choice for apparel. All right, you got the UPS guys. Brown pants. All right, you got the McDonald's people. They don't wear Taco Bell gear, even though Taco Bell gear is more stylish. I get it. But what they do is there's a separation involved, all right? Separation is not a bad thing, but I want to say this. In the separation process, be careful where you separate to. What you'll read after Lot separates is it becomes a one-sided situation where Abraham is always the one reaching out, reaching out, reaching out, reaching out, a or Lot finds his new crowd. He finds his new, new, uh, new uh, group, if you will. So I say this, 
Separation is going to happen, but be careful where you go and who you're with. Keep, keep, keep godly influences. My favorite group to work with is our TNT kids. I tell them this often. And I love when they come in. We had, I think, 29 TNTers yesterday and, and on our Saturday. It was, it was great. I just love being around. But I've seen many come. And I've seen many go. And when they walk away and they start doing their thing, can I say there's always a crowd that's welcoming you with open arms. They're there. And they're saying, come on. We love you. You're special. You're you. And while you are special and you are you, what happens is you gravitate to that and you get away from the people of God and those influences of faith and scriptures and church and service. And there's a separation that's going to happen. But in that separation process, I'm waving the flag and saying, don't be like Lot because he found a different crowd. Stay close to the godly influences around you. Number two, I raise the flag about separation. Number two, raise the flag about perception. The Bible says this about Elisha. There's a, he would go by this house of, of, this, of this couple, and he would go there regularly. And the lady said this to her husband. Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God. So she sat back and she watched the testimony of Elisha. And every time she saw him, she noticed there's something different about it. There was a perception. There was a, a, a decision made in her mind based on how he talked and how he walked and how he lived. And she said, I perceive that this is a holy man of God. Can I say there's some things in our lives we've got to be careful of in our discernment. Let me explain what that is. The, the, the discernment is pretty simple. It's the ability to be able to judge well. <laughs> you can look at a situation, you can say, uh, I don't think that's a good idea. I think that's a good idea, and make decisions based on that. This is what discernment is. It's the ability to see issues clearly. We desperately, we desperately need to cultivate this spiritual skill that will enable us to know right from wrong, distinguish light from darkness, truth from error, best from better, Righteousness from unrighteousness, purity from defilement, and principles from pragmatism. The idea is this. We have to be able to look at situations and say, I don't think that's a good direction for me and for my wife and for my family. We need to have some perception. Look at Genesis chapter 13. Both men in our text both saw some things, but it took them two very different directions. Look at verse number 10. And Lot, look at the phrase, lifted up his eyes. And beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Verse 11, then he makes a choice. Look at verse number 14, though. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look. So both men had the opportunity to look at something, but yet it took them completely different directions. Can I say, look here, look here. We had better guard our eyes. Because what you see, what you look at, will affect the direction that you go. David, a man after God's own heart, saw something he shouldn't have and it caused him to go that direction. Samson had eye problems. He saw this woman and he saw this woman and it took him a direction. Solomon had eye problems. I'm just saying we have to look with our eyes but have a perception that comes from God that says, you know what, you better be careful. Lot was doing okay. He was all right. He hadn't caved in yet, but he started on a path because of his eyes. This was interesting to me. Don't turn there, but Genesis chapter 2, when God was creating this, this earth, the Bible says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree, get this, that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And I, I read that, I thought, I feel like I've read that somewhere else. So God created the tree of knowledge of good and evil, good for food and pleasant to the eyes. So you go to the next chapter, Genesis chapter 3, verse number 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. 
God made it that way. Obviously, it's going to be true. So she's standing there. But what caused her to take of the fruit? She was influenced. Why she was near the tree, I have no idea. Why she was listening to the serpent, I have no idea. But I will say this. Your friends, your, 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 whatever you do, you're going to see sometimes, well, I just don't see it his way. Or I just don't see it her way. And Pastor Mitchell, you know, he's just kind of stiff. You know, I know he knows music, but he's just a little stiff. And Dr. Vogelin, I mean, he taught in the family a while. He's just old Fashion. I just don't see it that way. Can you sit? Can, can you believe this? Sometimes, Brother Albert, I sit in the pew and I have those thoughts. I just don't see it his way. Maybe because my eyes have been dimmed. All I'm doing is I'm just. Your perception will affect. Your life. Lot lifted up his eyes. The simple man, the Bible says, goes on the street near her corner. He gets close. You can read that in Proverbs 7 on your own time. All right. Separation, number one. Perception, number two. This one's interesting to me. I call this raising the red flag about frustration. Parents, do you ever get frustrated with your children? My mom's like, every day. Um, kids, have you ever been frustrated with your parents? No amens right now. They're all smiling. But can we stop for a moment and think about, do we frustrate God? Does God not have a plan of attack? He sure does. He has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a and the Bible says this, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And there are times, I look down at Hannah Walding down there. She's got her, her hair done so nice, and she's awake, and that's a good thing. And she's smiling, got her head leaning up against mom. And I'm not going to ask Mrs. Walding to divulge any problems with Hannah. But it's like, oh, that is so nice. That's so special. But I, I, I have a hunch that there are times where Mr. and Mrs. Walding sometimes are like, Probably with Thomas more than Hannah. I get it. Like, I have a plan. I, I want them to take the book from point A to point B. But somehow, they end up at point Z. I don't get it. And it's like, I've told them, and I've told them, and I've told them, and I've told them, and I am so frustrated. Mr. George Kriegel, I don't remember this, but years ago, he was at our house. He's already laughing. I think he remembers the story. And, and my brother and I were there, and my brother was working on higher math. And it was just beyond my mom's reach. Uh, higher math. And, and he's there, and I remember him talking to my brother. He's like, no, it's this and that. And he's like, it's so simple. And I remember getting up and just taking his hand and smacking my brother on the backside of the head. And he was so frustrated because in his mind, it was simple, it was easy, just do this to A and do this to B and see your way out, and everything is good. I'm like, it doesn't work. How come I'm finding X and Q? I don't get it. You know, the Christian life is really pretty simple. But sometimes we just do our thing and do our thing and do our thing. And I wonder today if we frustrate God. He comes along, and isn't he merciful? Let me try that again. Isn't he merciful? Sure thing. He's full of compassion. And in chapter 14, we see Lot get captured and taken away with all of his goods, and different kings come, and they overthrow the, 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 the city of Sodom, and Lot is taken, and here comes Abraham to the rescue. Again, changes his schedule, changes his routine, puts his life on the line for Lot, and they bring him back, and everything's well. And I, I, I stopped, and I was, I was thinking about this. I wonder if that was just a warning.
warning sign to say, Lot, hey, be careful, be careful. But we see no remorse. We, need, we see no change. We, need to say, we see him not coming to Abraham and saying, no, I'm so sorry. I need to get right. He goes right back to his thing. And I think he's frustrating the mercy and the grace of God. Let us be careful because God comes and he comes and he comes and he convicts and he convicts and he chides. And sometimes we just go on through life unchanged. That's a dangerous place to be. I'm raising the red flag about frustration today. Paul says it this way, I do not frustrate the grace of God. The idea of frustrating is to disesteem, to lower the value of the grace of God. It's easy for us to quote verses like this. For by grace are you saved through faith and not, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Aren't we thankful for the grace of God? But listen, the grace of God keeps us going in our Christian life, not just for salvation, but it sustains us as we go on day to day in our lives. And sometimes we get off track and God comes along and his mercy and his grace kind of steps in. Amen. And sometimes it just causes us not to be changed and unmoved. I guess I'm just warning you to not frustrate the grace of God. Look at chapter 19. We're almost done. Verse 15, And when the morning arose, the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed. Verse 16, And while he lingered, he hung around. He wasn't ready to go. And notice his little phrase in Second part of verse 16, the Lord being merciful unto him. Man. I, I wish I could just tell you what my heart's feeling right now when I stop and think of the mercy of God. I don't deserve to be in the ministry. I don't deserve to have the family that I came through and have the family that I have now. It's by the mercy and grace of God. But there's going to come times if we just keep frustrating God. I'm just raising the flag today and say, be careful that you're not frustrating God. When he, when he corrects you, change. When he speaks to you, move. When he says, do, do this, obey. Frustration. I'll mention this, but raise the red flag about our intercession. Genesis 18, God comes to Abraham, and he tells him, I'm going to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Help me out this morning. What does Abraham begin to do? Somebody? He begins to pray. And he goes to God, and as he stands before the Lord, says, God, if there are 50 righteous in the city, would you please spare the city? And God says, yes. Abram stops to think about it maybe for a bit and says, oh, I don't know if there's going to be 50. How about let's go down to 45, and down to 40, and down to 30. And I believe six times in Genesis chapter number 18, Abraham intercedes on behalf of his brother, as the text calls him, his brother Lot. I don't see anywhere in the scriptures where Lot is on his knees begging God for the, for the safety of his family and of those around him. But we see Abraham interceding. It, it's curious to me that why some people are more concerned about our lives than we are. Sometimes we sit back like, what are they doing? And you've probably done it to me. I'm not preaching at you. You're probably like, what is Ramus doing? He's being an idiot again. And we just go through life just really without a whole lot of thought. And people are just praying and begging God for on our behalf. And here's Abraham pleading. Now watch me. Lot has no idea this is going on. The pipe is about to burst. The ceiling is about to cave. The sand hill is about to come in. And Lot just goes on and on with his life as if everything is honky-dory, as they say. I was talking to my kids this week about um, why, why do they shoot horses when they break a leg? Now, Wendy likes to work with horses. Did, did, have you, do you have an answer for that? But, so the horse breaks his leg. And they shoot it pretty quick. Do you have any idea why? I didn't know either. The reason is because the horse will not allow, he won't be patient enough. So as soon as they wrap it, he tries to get back up and put the weight on it. He won't sit still. And so they know there's no hope for the horse. After he breaks his leg, it's done. Bam. Like, hey, kids, I won't, no, don't do that. He is not patient enough to take the time to be healed, etc. They say a lamb, when a lamb wanders, 
and again, this is just from reading. I don't know how accurate all this is, but they say that the shepherd will break the leg of the lamb when he wanders off and then take that lamb and put it around his neck and carry it until the leg is healed. And what that results in is a closeness to the shepherd. And I, I'm, I'm thankful for people in this church that have prayed for me and for my family. I try to pray for your families. But I'm telling you, there's some things we just have to, when somebody comes to us and they're interceding for us, say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, because I don't want to cave in. Let me end with this. Raise the red flag about our passions. Look at chapter 19 and we'll be done. Verse number one, and there came two angels of Sodom at evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And these men come in, and he says, hey, I want you to come to my house. Lot knows the wickedness of the city, so he's trying to keep these men from being ill-used by the men of the city. But, but look at verse four. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house about round and round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto them, Where are the men that came into this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. It, it would have been good if he just said, Get out of here. Now, now, now follow the text. He said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes? Only unto these men do nothing? What is wrong with this guy? And I often wonder if these two daughters that were in the cave with him heard him say that. And they said, in, in their minds, they're thinking, we're worthless. He was willing to turn us over to wickedness for two men that he didn't even know. And you see what happens when your life starts to get away from the, the, the godly influences and you start to frustrate the grace of God and you start to do these things. Your passions get on different. They get whacked out. You start to love the things you shouldn't. The Bible says Samson loved the woman. The Bible tells us we're supposed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. But our love changes. Our family situation changes. It's interesting. He calls these men brethren. Do not so wickedly. And what he probably would have said is absolutely crazy before he went to Sodom. Now he's accepting what is going on in Sodom. I don't have time to finish the story. But I think most of us know he loses his wife. He goes to his family members and he says, hey, God's going to judge the city. What do they do? They laugh at him. He drags his daughters out of the city. His house, his possessions are gone. And then we see the situation that we read in Genesis chapter 19. He becomes the father from his two daughters. I, I, I would say his life caved in. Alcohol, where they got it, I don't know, but they must have brought it along in a bag with them. Adultery, incest. I guess all I'm trying to say is none of us want life to cave in. If I would have known that our water pipe was going to break above our house, I probably would have done something about it. I remember Sunday night, I was leaving on Monday morning. Laying there, pop, pop. I remember calling Mr. Case. I'm like, I heard these noises. I don't know what it is. He said, I don't know. The water must have slowly started trickling, started trickling, started trickling. And Wednesday night, it caved in. If I would have known, I probably would have took, taken some action. There might be some things that we mentioned today that are just kind of Something behind the scenes, under the surface, that may be going on, leading to a cave. And I guess all I wanted to do was just say, I just want to warn you. Is your life about to cave in? I trust that this can be helpful. Let's pray. Lord, 
I know I needed this. It was very good reminders for me. It's easy to look at things the wrong way, to see, do, our own, do my own thing. And I sure don't want my life to cave in. You've given me a wonderful life. Your grace and mercy has been just outrageous to me, just in a, in a good way. It's been tremendous. And I don't want to lose what you blessed me with. And Lot started out with righteousness. He started out being with the friend of God. He pulled away and did his thing. Unmoved, unchanged, warned, frustrating God's grace. Lord, you've made this very real in my heart. And I pray that maybe someone here, one or two or three, might say, oof, there's an area that I need to, to look at. I need to get that taken care of, dealt with before the cave-in happens. Pray that you would work in hearts. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Would you stand to your feet? I know we always have a